Hi, I'm Ray Pucci. And I'm Lillian Brown. Welcome to this episode of Delco 360. Local Matters. Delco 360 Local Matters is a collaborative effort between the Delhi Telephone Company and the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce. In this episode, we take a look at several of the issues that are impacting businesses and residents here in Delaware County. Those issues include identifying some barriers to business growth in Delaware County. We'll also be talking about the Streamside Acquisition Program as posed by the DEC and DEP and how that might affect residents and businesses in Delaware County. And November 2nd is Election Day, but early voting starts on October 23rd. We're going to show you how easy it is to early vote here in Delaware County with our friends at the Delaware County Board of Elections. And our member spotlight in this episode features the historic Walton Theater. We'll give you a look at what's happening in Walton. And we end our episode, today's episode, with a look at the village of Stanford. We're gonna talk with the village um, of Stanford Mayor, Bob Schneider, about some of the recent developments that have been happening in that community. Stay tuned. The Streamside Acquisition Program piloted in Schoharie County is being proposed by New York City DEP as part of its land acquisition program to protect water quality. Delaware County government objects to the implementation of the new program, as does the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce and Industrial Development Agency. On this segment of Delco 360 Local Matters, we're taking a look at an issue that's really be, is going to be critical to our uh, future economy here in Delaware County, and that's the land acquisition program and specifically the Streamside Acquisition Program. And, and joining me here to talk about this is Nick Carbone. Nick is the uh, coordinator for the Watershed Affairs here in Delaware County, and Jim Thompson, who's the chairman of Delaware County Industrial Development Agency and Local Development Corporation. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining me here on Delco 360. Nick, let's start with you. Let's let's give us some context of what we're looking at. Land acquisition has been with us for almost 30 years here in the in the Catskills. Uh, this is a new development within that acquisition program. This program that we're talking about today is the Streamside Acquisition Program. It's um it's a it's a, a form of the land acquisition program but it was uh, put together prior to the 2010 uh, water supply permit that's issued by the DEC to New York City DEP. Um, this new program will waive some of the uh, limitations that were within the core land acquisition program. Uh, it's going to affect parcels less than 10 acres in size, and the potential exists to uh, impact villages, hamlets, and extended hamlet areas. So. These, the parcels that were excluded prior in the core land acquisition program are now available for purchase if this program goes through. So we're talking about the city being able to, essentially the city being able to purchase parcels that are less than, than 10 acres in size um, within the hamlets, outside the hamlets, in our extension areas, in the villages, uh, in the towns. This, this creates a whole new ball game for, for possible acquisition and further reducing the amount of land that we have developable. Is that a fair statement? Yes, it is. And the thing that we have to be concerned with is uh, if the villages, hamlets, and the hamlet extension areas decide to opt in, that means that all those parcels that we've been protecting as areas that could be developed in the future here in this county will be vulnerable and open to solicitation. So it's I feel like it's going to be important for us to make sure that these towns are well-informed, towns, villages, and hamlets, so that these they choose not to opt in and make all these parcels vulnerable. Outside of those areas, outside of the municipalities, uh, in the towns themselves, we don't have any control. So the potential exists that hundreds and hundreds of acres on every stream corridor in Delaware County would have the potential to be solicited for purchase through the site program. So let's take let's make this local. Uh, if the town board in Delhi were to say we're not opting in this program, uh, that would apply to those designated 
hamlet areas only, like Frasier's as an example. Um, but would that decision by the town board would have no impact of for areas outside those hamlet exactly. settings? They would all be, all those parcels would be fair game. Uh, some preliminary work that was done by our GIS, GIS specialist at the county planning department looked at uh, on a town by town basis, looked at parcels that might be, uh, would be available for purchase if it met the criteria. It's called surface water criteria, SWC. Um, that is ponds, lakes, wetlands, streams, and intermittent streams. So if any of those uh, criteria are met, those parcels would be available for purchase by DEP. Nick, what's intermittent stream? What are you talking about? It's a classification of stream that doesn't flow year round, but um, there's a certain period of time in the year where it could be flowing. So it could just be winter runoff. It could it could run for uh, a month in the spring and then dry up the rest of the year, but it would be, that's an intermittent stream. Jim, this sounds like the impact could be significant for for all of us, and particularly for the possibility of economic expansion here in the county, is that it's 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 far beyond what we're faced with now. And and let's not forget that right now, um, in in Delaware County, New York New York City DEP has purchased or has been under control through Watershed Ag Council, uh, twenty eight percent of the acreage in Delaware County, which translates into around 150,000 acres if you if 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 that'll give you a, villa, a visual um this this is serious stuff because we can't uh you can't you can't put a any any business at all on that 150,000 acres that's a big hole in the Delaware County economy this is going to by far uh exceed that 150,000 acres so right now it's at twenty eight percent. This is this removes those those restrictions. We could very easily be looking at forty, fifty, sixty right. percent. And and uh, my my question at this point is how much is enough? Uh, they they already control almost thirty percent of our land. Uh, isn't isn't that enough? Uh, and their water quality is fine. And they they talk about the the high quality of their drinking water. So it's it's to the point where it's not about water quality anymore. This is simply about open spaces, and and land grab. It's a total land grab, and and if you if you look back in the documents uh, that were that were filed, the original memorandum of agreement mm -hmm. and so forth, you'll see all through that document you'll see the the term partnership, and this whole thing is the success of this whole. Uh, MOA is built on a partnership. Well, DEC and, and the Catskill Center for Conservation and Development. Who are doing a solicitation <clears throat> as part of this program. Are, are working together and they have, the two of them have literally declared that the partnership is null and void. Uh, that's a serious, serious problem. And a serious breach of the, at least the spirit of, exactly. of, of that uh, agreement. Exactly. The... <sighs> You know, let's 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 if we can, and Nick, probably you're in a better position to talk about this. Um, let's let's apply some numbers to to what we're talking about. Um, we're on Dell High Telephone uh, cable system, and so a lot of folks who are watching us are are going to are in or around the town of Dell High, um, in the village of Dell High. How many? How much? You know, or the extension area for the village of Delhi. How much, what percentage? Do you know what percentage we're talking about that uh, could now be open to acquisition? 60, per, uh, 60 to 70 percent of the village parcels. Think about any parcel that has stream bank that's attached to it. That's the majority of parcels. The, uh, you have the, the main stem here and you have all these intersecting tributaries. Yeah. All, every, almost every lot. It, we looked at 60, 70 percent of the lots would be impacted or could be potentially impacted. That's in the Hamlet areas and the village areas. Now, outside of that, uh, you, you know that I'd say there's a myriad of streams out there, and they're sure. all any parcel that has a little bit of that stream frontage on it would be eligible. So, so 
just trying to make sure that, you know, we really present a picture of what the impact is going to be. And the village of Delhi is already, the uh, majority of the, of the acreage is already tax exempt. Um, these, these parcels, um, and we'll talk about subdivision in a moment, but the, so these parcels then go off the tax rolls or the parcels of those tax parcels they'll still be taxes paid on those parcels the tax those they'll still be taxed um, that that isn't really the most concern to me anyway that there's going to be taxed but what I, I see the biggest issue is currently there's a program set up for any parcels that want to be put uh, for sale by the landowners have to wait till every five year period there's a five year period where okay. they can bring they can bring these to the town boards and uh, open their parcels up for solicitation. There's no provisions for that in this SAP program. So that means that these town boards will be faced with, could be on a monthly basis, landowners trying, to, if they want to sell their property, petitioning the town boards. So can you imagine being on a town board and having to face, what it's done is it's going to pit landowners against municipal representatives, and that's a difficult situation to be in. Now, some of these parcels that would be created, because the city isn't going to be interested in the entire, the parcel in its entirety, they're going to be interested in, in a certain area within and around that, that waterway. Right. Um, so you're going to be creating a situation, perhaps, or very likely, where you have non-conforming parcels. Is that going to be permitted? Well, this is the problem. It's going to take a change in some subdivision law, and the villages and uh, towns will have to accept those. They'll have to be, they'll have to accept those by resolution. Those changes in the subdivision law, and if you do end up with two non-conforming parcels, uh, that goes that flies right in the face of all zoning, zoning and uh, and land use regulations in any town. So if you allow the DEP to do that via through the third party of the Catskill Center, um, you're going to have to allow everyone to do that. So that's so we're really that's losing local control, we're losing local control, and some orderly system of lot development. Now, Jim, one of the hamlets around Delhi, uh, hamlet designations is Frasers, right. and in Frasers we have <clears throat> Domo, we have Saputo, uh, we have Sports Field Specialties, and in, in that area. Um, and Clark companies. And Clark companies. Um, <laughs> what are going to be those restrictions if, you know, we have, and that runs right along the West Branch of the Delaware. So well, if some they, of that land disappears, what does that mean? Well, that, that means no further economic growth. Um, they, they've already calculated that <clears throat> if this program goes into effect as presented, that 91% of the acreage in the, in the hamlet of Fraser is subject to, to land acquisition. So that means that New York City is going to be battling to buy as much of the land as, as possible. And that's our industrial growth. That's where all of our jobs are in the village of Delhi. The the other thing that, that, that we need to think about is that when New York City buys a piece of property, <clears throat> they immediately file a an easement on the pro, on the property uh -huh. for DEC. The DEC easement does That's not. That's New York State Department <clears throat> of Environmental Conservation. Right. Our our friendly government um, takes control of that property via an easement, and that easement forbids any utilities on or above or underneath that piece of property. So if you have a piece of property on the other side of the river uh -huh. and you sell your river frontage and the and the and this easement gets put in place if you want to run an electrical power line in the air just of, a utility uh, line uh, that's uh, what we're talking right, about a utility line across that river frontage you can't do it you can't run a, you can't run a water supply line across that river you can you can ironically Run a sewer line across the river, <laughs> but that, that, that which I think is a little self-serving, but uh, but that that means that that piece of property is totally useless. So, guys, how did we get how did we get here? 
How, who let this? Who let well, this happen? What happened to all those those safeguards that we were supposed to have in place that things well, like this didn't happen? I could say that you know this the negotiation for this program took place prior to 2010 because it was included in the water supply permit, DEC's water permit supply permit. But what had happened is during that time period, especially in Delaware County, there was thousands of acres being bought through the Core Land Acquisition Program. So when it was brought out that there may be some program, this riparian buffer program, which would concentrate on smaller uh, parcels and a more focused land acquisition program, that sounded appealing to people. But Delaware County's position has been all along that uh, they didn't want to have to change subdivision law. They wanted a program that would mirror this conservation reserve program that's been going on here with the uh, USDA and uh, uh, since uh, I think about 1999 here in this county. That CREP program lets the land stay with the landowner. The landowner continues to pay tax. They get an uh, annual rental agreement. They maintain it. They maintain it. There's money available for stewardship, tree planting, uh -huh. whatever. That CREP, uh, C -R -E -P, which the E stands for enhanced, meaning that 100% of it was paid for, that focused on ag land, but the, I don't see any reason, there is no reason it couldn't focus on lands outside of agricultural land. Land is land, right? So that's been that's been the position all along. There was several resolutions that were passed in 2018 that stated that unless the towns would have control over whether this program was expanded or not, and have some control over whether parcels could be purchased in that town, Delaware County didn't want anything to do with it. And that's been their, their stance all along. And I noticed that in the last meeting of the Board of Supervisors, um, Tom Snow said that, well, Delaware County was present during the stakeholders' meetings and, and wanted this program, but with the caveats that the towns wouldn't have to accept it if they didn't want to, and that it would be a program that mirrored CREP. And the third caveat was that if that was going to take place, this repairing buffer program, that the core land acquisition program would be eliminated. And none of those things have been proposed. Jim, we're supposed to have safeguards in place. I well, understand how the, how we got there with the process. Frankly, when uh, going back in history again uh, with the MOA in 1977, uh, that mandated that, that we form the Catskill Watershed Corporation and <clears throat> that, that we have the, the um, a coalition of watershed towns. The Catskill Watershed Corporation was was put in place to administer septic system programs and economic development programs and stormwater and, storm and all water. those kind of issues. Yeah. The the water uh, the the coalition of watershed towns was put in place to protect those of us that live in the watershed, and frankly, they haven't been doing their job. Uh, and it's it's time that that they that they change the way of, of doing business and go in a different direction. They're the ones that can and should be speaking out to protect us from this kind of a violation of that partnership right. happening. And obviously, at this point, to date, that part hasn't happened. Exactly. So, gentlemen, I may Jim. Maybe this is more to your to you. But what do we do? How, well, <laughs> maybe <laughs> it's TB. We're being kind here. Um, what's the next step? How do we? How do those of us, you know, those who are watching, um, how are we able to affect some change? What steps do we take? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, we we all need to reach out to our elected officials. And we need to talk first. Firstly, we have to talk to our uh, Delaware County, uh, our town supervisors, uh -huh. and those that sit on the Delaware County board. Those people at the Delaware County board level are the ones that nominate the board members of the Coalition of Watershed Towns. Okay. And we need to pressure them and talk to them about getting some people that are going to be serious about protecting those of us that live in the watershed. That's what the charter of the of the water of the coalition of watershed right. towns is. Um, number two, I think that that it's important that we uh, contact and and work with our state elected representatives, our state senators, so, or our assembly yeah, representatives. Delaware County is in a position. We have three uh, state assembly districts uh -huh. in Delaware County. We have three senate districts yeah. in Delaware County. That's a lot of votes and and a lot of. 
a lot of people in, in representing a small rural county like us. We need to talk to those people. I'm, I'm convinced that they aren't even, they don't even have a clue that this is going on. DEC is flying under the radar with this thing in conjunction with the Catskill Center. And I think it's time that we have to raise the awareness level with all of our elected officials. About the activities, both of, maybe not all of DEC, but at least some subset of DEC yeah. staff, yeah. May not, the folks at the upper level, commissioner level and the like, may not even be aware of what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, making sure that, that those folks at DEC know that, I mean, the folks, our elected officials, know what DEC is up to and frankly what the Catskill Center is up to right now, mm -hmm. operating hand in glove and, and with that glove strangling us and in, in our economic future. Well, a determination needs to be made. This is part of the water supply permit by DEC to expand the program beyond the pilot pro program in the Schoharie Basin. Okay. So currently it's been operating as a pilot program in the Schoharie Basin. At some point, DEC has to provide this written determination saying it should be expanded. And that's supposed to be based on uh, feedback they've gotten from Department of Health, um, DEP, the, town, the municipalities, lo local towns, counties, everyone should have input into that, whether that's expanded or not. And that written determination has not been made up to this point. So I think that is an opportunity for us to, to express our concerns and hopefully uh, influence that somehow. So it's a, it's a serious issue and we have to move quickly, I think. So we have an opportunity right now. And so I guess the, the, our call to action uh, for all of you is to contact your town supervisor, make sure that your town supervisor understands the issue that's involved here, uh, talk with your town supervisor about the coalition of watershed town representation here in Delaware County, how in, frankly inadequate, is that a fair statement? That's being kind, huh? Um, inadequate that it's that it's been to date regarding particularly this this issue, and contact our state senators and and assembly representatives and make sure that they are aware of what's happening and perhaps with enough with enough voices this could be ended. Fair. And, and, and remember, in earlier conversations, we talked about the fact that during the original negotiation, New York City has set a goal of controlling 30% of the land in the in Delaware County. It's already there. They're at 28% now, they're, they're, they're there. Um, and I submit that enough's enough and it's time to stop this, this craziness and uh, live within what the projections were years ago. Well, gentlemen, thank you. And this won't be the last time that I'm going to, that you'll be on Delco 360 Local Matters to talk about this issue. I have a feeling this is something that's going to continue for, for a little while at least. And you can all be sure that we'll keep you involved um, in, in this issue and keep you informed as to what's happening. Contact your elected officials and tell them you object to this program. The Board of Elections office in Delhi is the only early voting location in Delaware County. I'm at the Delaware County Board of Elections at 3 Gallant Avenue here in the village of Delhi, where early voting for November's election actually starts on Saturday, October 23rd. Let's go in and find out how we how do we early vote? I'm joined by Robin Alger, who's one of the deputy election commissioners here in Delaware County. We're, she's going to show us how to early vote. Okay. Welcome to the Delaware County Board of Elections. And this is how we early vote. And we're going to look your name up. Okay. And it's P-U. Yeah, P-U-C-C-I. And Ray. Yeah. There I am. And is that you? That is me. Okay, we're going to get to see my birthday. Yes. And then we're going to let you sign your name if that's you. Whoop. Get done signing when you're all done. And I'm going to sign my initials. All, all right, right. And we're going to print a ballot out over here. Okay. You're going to come.
come right on over here. Come on, folks, let's follow. It's a privacy sleeve, so when you're done, you're gonna fill in the circle, whoever you wanna vote for. Okay. And, we'll, and don't forget there's propositions on the back. Ballot successfully cast. We just early voted, just that simple, folks. Remember, early voting starts at the Delaware County Board of Elections on Saturday, October 23rd. So we're outside the Board of Elections in Delhi, and these are our ballot drop-off boxes. There's one on each side of the building, and if we're not here, or even if we are here, you're able to bring your absentee ballot and drop it off here. You just lift it up, then you stick the ballot in, and put it down, and we check them each day. Your vote matters. Please vote. Chamber asked its members, what makes your business tick? What challenges do you have growing your business? And which resources are valuable to you? Here's what we learned. I'm here with Todd Pasquarella. Todd is the chairperson of the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. He also is one of the owners of Union Grove Distillery in Arkville. And we're talking today about the needs that business owners have here in Delaware County. Uh, recently, the Chamber hosted a series of business check-in and community sync-up sessions uh, in Arkville, in Hancock, in Delhi. We also did it virtually. Uh, and we started with one simple question. What's stopping you? What's the barrier that you have as a business owner to growing and developing your business here in Delaware County. Todd, let's talk about some of the some of the challenges that our owner that our business owners identified. Where do you want to start? Well, uh, we could start with uh, things like the seasonality challenges that that people are are running into. Um, Explain what that means. Well, this is something that we uh, have to uh, address here in in the area uh, b based on the. The tourism uh, patterns that people tend to follow, we uh, as business owners try to uh, keep the year round revenue flow as much sure. as possible, which is is necessary thing to run a business. However, we do have to also accommodate ups and downs, both uh, because of the uh, slow seasons in the spring and in the uh, in the autumn as well, as well as throughout the week itself. So the weekends tend to be way more busy during midweeks, we see a lot less traffic. Um, these are, these are uh, things that we know are um, challenges that are built in here, although um, for running a, a successful business, it's definitely something that, that is a concern and needs to be addressed. And, and you know, essentially, how do we smooth out those, those peaks and valleys? How do we make those, maybe not reduce the peaks, but how do we make those valleys maybe not quite so deep? Correct. Um, as as they've they they are experiencing now, what are some of the other issues that you that we heard that well, you, that you see? Uh, business owners are seemingly always uh, in search of enough capital to keep their uh, you know business running to meet payroll to make improvements that they need. Um, and in these days here uh, in the last year and a half or so, um, people have spent a lot of their money just plugging holes and dealing yeah. with uh, adaptation. So um, access to capital, long-term capital is a, is a big concern. And, and one of the things that I heard uh, during that session was particularly with a lot of our new and recent business uh, that have opened just in the last couple of years. We've had a number of businesses, new businesses that have opened in Delaware County over the last 18, 24 months. Um, but because they're still relatively new, they're not, uh, financing may not always be an option for them, at least the traditional financing that's available. Uh, so improving that, that access to capital is certainly going to be a big issue, continues to be a big issue for, for business owners. What else? What else did we hear? Well, um, you know, the usual uh, issues around workforce staffing, both in terms of the availability and the quantity yeah. of staffing, but in, in terms of uh, preparedness of staffing and the training that they need to get up to speed and the, and the uh, ability of the workers to meet the tasks at hand. And that uh, seems to always be, uh, um, you know, predictably a, a challenge for business owners, but in, in these times specifically uh, with people leaving jobs, coming back, 
leaving the area, that sort of thing. Um, you know, we have uh, well, and, and other challenges to do with unemployment and and uh, you know many many host of reasons. But that is uh, understandably plaguing uh, people who are um, looking to either you know stay stay stable or even grow their businesses. Mm -hmm. As you said, it's remarkable there are a number of new businesses yeah. that were able to come along throughout this period. Um, but inevitably, everyone runs into this same uh, barrier with the staffing issues. So, what about housing? Housing is always. I mean, before the before the pandemic even began, housing was a challenge because you know the the kinds of salaries and wages that people can afford to pay um, in in the Catskills here uh, is limited by well seasonality, access to capital, all the things we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so you know, a lot of us wish we could pay more, but the reality is that we have to pay what we can afford to pay for certain for certain jobs. Um, so that limits the uh, available funds that, that workers have to be able to afford the housing that they need. Um, so inevitably we run into this cycle where, um, you know, there's a there's a gap between um, pay and say rent, average rent that's that's needed for people to be able to afford and, you know, even even uh, home buying as, as well. So um, definitely a challenge in terms of the imbalance between um, wages that are available and uh, both the, the, the cost mm -hmm. and the quantity of housing that's that would be needed to meet that same uh, you know, workforce demand. Now we haven't looked at, we haven't discussed today and a little premature to be looking, talking about so possible solutions. Uh, but one of the solutions that, that you've been talking about for some time is this idea almost of clustered housing in some communities. Do you want to talk about that just a little bit? Sure. Well, I mean, we've seen throughout our communities how it, it sort of started with the shortage of lodging. And the shortage of lodging uh, created a need for the market to find a solution, and that's been short-term rentals and mm -hmm. those Airbnbs, um, as well as other things. But a lot of our housing stock has actually slid over and become lodging stock, and that has left an even even bigger hole uh, in in the uh, market for for affordable housing where it's needed. So. Um, you know, what I've heard from a lot of people and, and sort of what I'm trying to bring to the forefront is the idea of needing to make up ground in terms of the amount of housing that has been lost, but is actually is, is never there to begin with. It's necessary for economic growth. And, uh, you know, we have limited land available for development here in our uh, Catskills and the watershed. So we need to make better use of some of that land by uh, uh, you know, potentially clustering housing developments closer to uh, closer to themselves, closer to each other, and closer to utilities and the resources that you need to keep the cost of the housing down. So we, you know, we for many years saw um, sort of you know uh, houses being built around the the countryside on right. on larger plots of land, sure. um, but those are rather expensive. And for someone starting out, say in their young twenties or or with a family, what have you. Um, you know, building a house on five acres or more um, when you're starting is not necessarily a, an option. So we need to provide those uh, lower cost options and, you know, perhaps uh, protect them from, uh, you know, from being turned into short term rentals. Um, but these are the kind of challenges that, that are, are out there for people looking to find an affordable place to live here now. Yeah, you know, one of the one of the topics that came up uh, in a couple different places, a couple different uh, places uh, was the maybe the way I could best describe it is the the attitudes um, of of folks that uh, you know we the chamber is often called the, the the cheerleader for the county and that's part of what a chamber of commerce certainly does but uh, that there's not a, we're not, we don't always think as positively as we should about our community. Um, any feelings about that? I think part of it is that people want to feel like they're they're listened to, and you know, for us as a chamber, this whole exercise is really about following through on that concept of gathering information from the people that we're serving and interacting with, so we can digest it and make it a part of uh, you know what we're doing to develop the solutions. I think if you just ex exist in a vacuum, you're not really going to get that accurate information enough to to create the solution. So. Um, a lot of it is is people. I think their their morale dropping, you know, in general, but because of the fact that they don't feel like we're we're working together on a lot of these. Well, things. they don't feel connected. Right. They feel like we're in our own silos. 
here and there and everywhere. And, and if people were working together more, um, we'd get a lot more done to, to, to fix these problems. Yeah, and one of the things that I heard uh, several times from lots of different people is that, a, that uh, desire of, of business owners to work more collaboratively with other business owners. And that, in a lot of ways, is really central to why we have a Delaware County Chamber of Commerce. Right. Yeah, it's very true. And business owners really do not want to see each other as uh, competitors here. They rather, you know, we're all looking to survive and do do well enough. And and so, you know, wherever we can collaborate, um, those are those are the things that we should should focus on finding the means to do so. Great. Well, Todd Pascarella is Todd's the chair of of the of the Delaware County Chamber Board of Directors. Thank you for the time today and talking about this. Um, what's the next step? Well, uh, the Chamber Board is going to uh, start to digest this information and we're going to um, incorporate it into our long-term strategic planning. We're also going to look at uh, existing programs that we do have, and existing connections we have that can be put to use for some of these challenges. And we're also going to look at areas where we need, may need to develop some new programming. So this is a very, uh, very helpful step in us developing um, our next year's worth of uh, vision on how we're gonna yeah. how we're gonna serve the community. Great, and there are more of these programs, these check-in sessions coming up during the month of November, likely over in Stanford, Walton, and Sydney. So watch for that as as well. And of course, we'll keep you informed here on uh, through whatever means that we can uh, here at the Delaware County Chamber. Stanford was first settled by trappers and farmers in the 1700s and grew rapidly as a stopover for travelers on the Catskill and Susquehanna turnpikes. In the early 1800s, the village acted as a distribution center for area farmers and the fast-growing butter industry in Delaware County. During this period, people would occasionally travel to Stanford to hike and camp in the mountain air. However, it was not until the construction of the Ulster and Delaware Railroad in 1872 that Stamford grew as a resort area. Stamford has a thriving and growing business community and an abundance of recreational activities available to residents and tourists alike. At Mount Utsayantha for hiking, sightseeing, and picnicking, at Veterans Park, and Indian Trail Park. Stanford Mayor Rob Schneider gave us an update on what's happening in the village. For this segment of Delco 360 Local Matters, we're joined by Bob Schneider, who is the mayor of the village of Stanford. Bob, thanks for joining us today on, on Delco 360. Uh, Stanford, over the past year or so, has really seen something of a revitalization. A lot of new businesses, a lot of new energy. What's going on? What do you attribute all that to? Well, most people would suggest that it's all COVID related, and I'm not going to say that that certainly isn't a contributing factor. But this had started uh, a year or so before COVID arrived. It did, um, yes. The village, uh, at least real estate sales, had ticked up quite a bit. And we had a couple of new businesses that were on their way, but they did happen to open post COVID, and we've had many join them. I think we have six in total on Main Street within the past 12 months. We've had a tremendous turnover of residential uh, real estate and, and some commercial real estate. So COVID certainly was a driving force, but I think there, there was a renaissance happening in the Western Catskills ahead of that, if you were to have seen what was going on in Margaretville and Andes and uh, so forth. Uh, I think uh, the train was definitely out of the station already. Well, I think you're right. And I think what, what COVID did, um, it's, it's sort of the same phenomenon that I saw after uh, 20 years ago, after September 11th, was the conditions were already happening on the ground, as you say. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, COVID may have been something of an accelerator. Uh, to make that happen just a little bit faster and and maybe we all were just paying more attention. Uh, yes, but I also think that this has a lot more staying power. Oh yes, uh, yes, yes. Because people have discovered a, a new way to network and work remotely. 
Uh, I know that businesses uh, in, in Manhattan that felt they would lose uh, productivity from their employees from working at home, mm -hmm. uh, kind of discovered that it was just the opposite, that they yeah. got a lot more out of their employees when they were working at their leisure. And I have a feeling that's going to free up a lot of commercial real estate business in, in Manhattan as time goes by. Unfortunately, that's probably that's probably very true. Um, and and talking with, you know, you're in the real estate business as well, and we both have friends who are in real estate down in down in uh, the metropolitan area. <clears throat> We're both hearing, I'm sure, um, about those those that high vacancy rate mm -hmm. down there. And unfortunately, I think a lot of that's going to continue. And we're kind of we're some of the beneficiaries of, of that. Oh, absolutely. And the village of Stanford uh, has a lot to offer to people that want to relocate to a country setting without being out in the boondocks. We have a grocery store, a drug store. Uh, we have village infrastructure with uh, village water and village sewer. So we have the, the kind of services that people are accustomed to in, in a more urban setting so that they're not worried about buying some house that has a well and has a private, se private septic system that can fail and so on and or so forth. Or what's a septic system? Well, exactly. So, uh, so the village is well positioned actually for, for what's happening, I think. So you, you mentioned the several new businesses, six new businesses just here on Main Street alone uh, in, the, in the last year and certainly a lot of new people um, moving into the area, rehabilitating a lot of the homes that mm -hmm. we have here in, in Stanford. All very positive developments over the last 18, 24, 36 months. That's true. And the, the businesses, you, businesses you see on Main Street are really like uh, the tip of, of an iceberg because there are mm -hmm. a tremendous volume of other businesses that don't have a retail location on right. our Main Street. So we have a new uh, business alliance, which I know you've been to a couple of the meetings, sure. uh, the Stanford Business Alliance. I think they're better than 60 members strong at this point. And they have a lot of, a lot of different cottage industries that are sprinkled around uh, Stanford and Hobart and Jefferson. So it's a nice group, uh, very active. It is, it is, and, and they're, they're young and, and right. enthusiastic. Uh, and really want to get things done, which is all, that's all terrific. Um, let's talk for a moment about some of the new projects that you're working on as mayor uh, here in the village of Stanford. Uh, some of the infrastructure improvements that, that you and your board, and I should say we're meeting here in the in village hall at, at where your, your village meetings typically are. What are some of those projects that we can look forward to over the next coming months? Uh, well, we're in the middle of building our new municipal swimming pool, which is a gift to the village from the Robinson Broadhurst Foundation. That's tremendous. Um, in my view, it's going to be the finest municipal swimming pool in Delaware County. Uh, it was designed by David Altman, who was a local architect. Um, the pool will be open for the 2022 season and at that time we'll be filling in the uh, current pool that was built back in 1959. Mm. Uh, in addition to that, we have a TAP uh, transportation alternatives program from New York State, okay. a grant for about $2.4 million. We will be replacing all of the sidewalks in the village from the intersection of Harbor, uh, Route 10 and 23 of Harbor okay. Street and Lake Street down to about uh, where um, the dollar store is. Oh, that's cool. And the goal of this is to make all of our sidewalks ADA compliant as well as the crosswalks and to lose the uh, red paving stones that have been a real problem since they were installed back in 1981. Uh, and in addition to this, we'll be replacing the overhead uh, street lamp lighting with more historic uh, street lamps. Oh, really? So we're, we're just in the process of, of choosing those fixtures now. That project is about to go out to bid. Uh, we also have a, the second half of a $3.8 million um, water infrastructure project uh, that started with replacement of our existing water tank up on the hillside here. Mm -hmm. And now we're doing uh, water main replacement along Lake Street, uh, West Main Street, River Street, and the Hobart Road. 
uh, that has just gone out for bid and that should start it probably in the spring of next year. So all told, we've got around somewhere between eight and nine million dollars of infrastructure projects, which is a lot for a village of 1,200 people. Oh, well, sure. And it sounds like it's going to be an exciting 22. 2022. It really is, and, and we we managed uh, recently to demo some problem uh, structures. Yeah, uh, we have uh, one if more that we're wrestling with, but we did manage to remove the former Madison Hotel and the rear portion of this uh, historic house next to the Village Hall, okay. and a derelict gas station down on Main Street. And that gas station is going to become a village park. Really? Mm -hmm. Terrific. You know, and, and the village has a role. We, we talk about economic development. We talk about what's happening with, with private businesses. Um, and the, the village has, uh, village government specifically, has a role in that, in, in, to, in creating an atmosphere that's conducive for private business. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and one of the areas I, I'd like to discuss with you is, is uh, the idea of, of cannabis sales. Uh, New York, in New York State Legislature several months ago uh, made cannabis uh, legal here in New York State and um, allowed municipalities to, if they wish to, opt out of having that legal business in their communities. Uh, the village of Stanford chose not to opt out. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about what went into that decision? Well, or non-decision, <laughs> if you will. Right. There's, there's not a tremendous volume of information about, about this process at the moment, but it is kind of like the end of prohibition. Uh, I think we have to understand that this is now something that's legal. Uh, the communities around us are, I don't know if they're opting in or opting out, but I wouldn't want to put the, the village in the position of being the the community that opted out and then was sorry later. Uh, we can opt in and not do anything about it. We, we really, as I said, have limited information on how this is going to roll out. Uh, but if there is a financial benefit in any way to the village of Stanford, uh, I, as a mayor, have a fiduciary responsibility to at least explore that. So um, that's really where we are with it. And again, it's, it seems to be so preliminary at this point. Yeah, I think um, with, a new, with a new governor that seems to be committed to uh, getting some action at the state level mm -hmm. on, on the Office for Cannabis Management, uh, some of those questions will start to be answered. Uh, but supporting, supporting legal business, uh, you know, I thank you for that, for that measure of support. Uh, in, in, in the village of Stanford's efforts to support any legal business here in the municipality. Right. With the proviso that you can always regulate as to where and, and things like that within your limits. Well, exactly. Uh, uh, and the village government is here for the service of the taxpayers and business owners are certainly a big component of that. Sure. I mean, if we're going to revitalize our main street and take advantage of the regional renaissance, you know, we can't uh, bind ourselves up with decisions we may regret later. Um, Bob, what else do we have to, what else is happening in Stanford that you want to let folks know about? Uh, well, I besides mean, an invitation to come and visit, <laughs> yes, come, please come down to Stanford. You can see for yourself. Uh, we we have a lot of new businesses, a lot of activity, a concert series, uh, art gallery, uh, more coming, uh, more coming this year, more in the spring. Uh, come down and swim in our new pool uh, after the first of July next year. I think you'll be impressed. And again, we, we thank the Robinson Broadhurst Foundation for that very generous gift to the village. What a tremendous asset mm -hmm. to have in a community like this. And, and it will remain open for you to the public. That's great, terrific. Bob Schneider is the mayor of the village of Stanford. Thank you for joining me this My afternoon. Pleasure. And folks, if you haven't seen, if you haven't been to Stanford recently, you haven't been to Stanford. Right at the intersection of state highways 10 and 23 in the northern edge of the county, come up and, and visit and find out what's new here in the village of Stanford.
There are a variety of infrastructure upgrade projects in the village of Stamford, including the construction of the Robinson Broadhurst Foundation Memorial Swimming Pool, which is expected to open in 2022. So welcome to the new Stamford uh, Municipal Pool, the Robinson Broadhurst Memorial Pool. Uh, it's an L-shaped pool, obviously, here. Kitty pool, decking. Behind you is the uh, pool house with the dressing rooms, a concession stand, the pool equipment, lifeguard station, and so forth. Uh, around the perimeter, these will be covered brick clad piers, and there'll be black cast iron fencing in between these. And then the uh, deck, concrete decking, will enclose this entire space. There'll be no grass within the pool enclosure. Whatever your interest or reason for visiting, the village of Stamford, the queen of the Catskills, has something for everyone. Remember, shop small and shop local. We are stronger together. Step back in time to enjoy classic and contemporary films and performances at the historic Walton Theater, located at 30 Gardner Place in Walton. The Walton Theater was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1984. The Walton Theater Preservation Association was organized to ensure the restoration and enhancement of the Walton Theater and its equipment. It seeks to preserve the historic nature of the theater in order to provide a venue for live performances and an active arts center. The theater welcomes and encourages live performances, art exhibits, first-run and classic and independent films. In 2019, the Walton Theater Preservation Association kicked off its latest project, the restoration of the balcony. Welcome to the Walton Theater. I'm joined today by Jim Richardson from the Walton Theater Preservation Association, who has been doing a lot of work on the restoration of the balcony. Jim, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on here at the Walton Theater? Sure. Um, well, the balcony was really the last project. We, uh, I don't think the balcony was touched for the hundred years that the theater has been in existence. Uh, the floor was black uh, gum that was probably historic gum. Uh, Underneath the seats? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay. So we, we started out by taking out all the seats. All the seats up here were original wooden seats and we took them all out and um, the you'll notice the back row if you have a chance to look at it they are original seats all refinished we we got the ones that were in good shape and uh, refinished them and but while all the seats were out we had the floor totally refinished um, and uh, so that was really the first step um, and, we, and that was to bring the theater back to its original luster. Precisely, precisely. Because remember, our mission was twofold. It was to restore the theater physically, but we didn't want to just make a museum. We wanted it also to be a, a, a real useful venue that could be used for all sorts of things. And so we wanted to bring, bring certain things up to current standards without losing the historic uh, nature of the theater. So we, we finished the floor, we took out all the seats, we, uh, we ordered new seats to match the ones that are downstairs. Uh, you would have thought that we would have had this all done six months ago, but of course everything came to a halt. We were able to do work in here, but the seats couldn't be ordered. The and that was because of COVID? And, yes, the, okay. pad, the factories were shut down. Uh, the seats only came in about a month ago. And this is after being ordered, oh, almost 10 months ago. So we, uh, but we moved ahead. Uh, we had some carpentry work to do. The uh, console for the sound and lights, uh, we rebuilt and that's back over my shoulder. Um, and we built a, a, a wall there coming up the stairs. And uh, what else did we do? With and you've installed some beautiful um, tables yep. and some chairs. Well, and we, did, we decided rather than putting seats over here because they really weren't, the seats that were here before you really couldn't see. And we thought, well, that's, that's silly. Let's do something a little interesting. So we found a whole bunch of old uh, film reels. And then we found somebody who cut the glass for us. And we found these stands from a place in New York City. 
and put together these tables. They're absolutely beautiful. And then we thought, well, you know, it'd be kind of nice to have little, like, cabaret lights on. And so that's what these are. I, I didn't put them in on the other side. This is just for, for tonight, for today. Um, and these are all battery operated and remote controlled. So when do you have the expectation that the balcony area will be open for people to use? Not too far down the road because the carpet now has been ordered and we're expecting that to be installed. I think it's next week. Okay. So once that carpet goes down and we can put the railings on the stairs, the steps, we can uh, put, there will be small tables in between the seats on this first row. Um, so we'll be able to install those. Um, so very exciting. It's um, yeah. almost coming full circle here. And not too long ago, um, I think our viewers can see the, um, the uh, screen behind us where the movies are shown. There was a projector fundraiser and uh, not too long ago, and we have a new projector here at the Walton Theater. Well, not too long ago. It was probably <laughs> seven or eight years ago. It was right. amazing. But yes, when the, when the um, distrib distributors of films switched over from film to digital, we knew something had to be done because uh, RSS, have support services, who leases the theater and runs the movies, didn't have money for an $80,000 projector. So we did the campaign that you talked about, and, and now we have a digital projector in there. Um, but yeah, that, that seems like just yesterday, but it really was quite a while ago. And the and, community has really come oh. to, and the Delaware County community at large has uh, oh. really come together for the, um, the restoration efforts. Jim, tell us a little bit more about what people can expect when they come to the Walton Theater. You offer all types of um, entertainment here, not just new release movies, but you uh, offer some classic fix, flicks yep. um, and also some live performances. Can you tell our viewers a little bit yeah, about one, that? Once a month, uh, there's a, a, a classic flicks night and uh, that, that's every month and uh, that's on a Thursday night. Um, we also, the, the Music on the Delaware brings concerts in here. Uh, we have six scheduled this year. Um, actually, we had seven. One of them, one of them canceled out for, for this month. And, but we do have Cherish the Ladies coming back in December, <laughs> which is always a very popular thing. So those are live stage shows. Okay. Uh, we just had one um, several weeks ago. Um, and then in, that is supplemented by a series of coffee houses, which take place in the what we call the parlor, which is a, a small room here um, upstairs in the theater. Okay. And that's desserts and coffee. It's free, donations only, and uh, that's a s tables and chairs. So it's small, smaller group, and um, we have one of those coming up in two weeks. Uh, so that, for our viewers' sake, that is going to be when. At the end of October, the that's yes. It's, it, they're always on Sunday evenings from six to eight. Okay. And I'm I'm confused on dates right now, okay. but it's <laughs> it's next okay. next Sunday, not this coming Sunday, but the following Sunday. And I think we're going to see another long-held tradition um, here at the Walton Theater, which is the annual Christmas show. Yes, yeah, and that's as, as usual. That will be the first weekend of December, and that's the Delaware River Stage Company, and that's always a lot of fun because that's local people and and kids and just a lot of fun, just a real Christmassy thing. Uh, Jim, if people wanted to contribute or make a donation to the Theater Preservation um, Association so that they could assist in the rehabilitation, how might they be able to do that? Well, first, we'd gladly accept it. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, Please. they send it to uh, uh, the Walton Theater Preservation, just WTPA actually, okay. PO Box 1 and just make it out to WTPA. Okay, and so Jim, can you tell our viewers where they might be able to find out more information about the Walton Theater? Yes, there is a website, uh, waltontheater.org, and theater is spelled T-R-E, uh, waltontheater.org, and that, that'll have basically, that should have everything on it that's going on in the theater. Great. Um, Come on down to the Walton Theater at Gardner Place in the village of Walton. See you soon. To support this and future projects, consider donating to the Walton Theater Preservation Association. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Delco 360 Local Matters. See you next time.